Hi everyone, this is Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel about statistics and making you better at it. Modern statistics is done with computer and code, not pen and paper. If you're looking to get into more analytic roles in 2024, whether you're a statistician, a business analyst, or a data scientist, you need to be proficient with coding. I'll teach you how to start with R in a short video. There are two main languages you can choose from to do statistics, Python and R. There are a few more, but nobody really cares about them. It doesn't really matter which one you choose, what matters is that you're a skill at one of them. I use both, but I'm faster and better at R, so I'm in a better position to teach it. But if you'd like to see Python content, let me know in the comments. This video will not make you a god at programming in R. No single YouTube video can do that for you. Instead, the goal of this video is to quickly teach you the essential concepts of R and the tidyverse paradigm of R programming. Let's get started. Statistics is the study of data, so you need to know what types of data are available in R. There's numeric data, which can take the form of either integers or floats. Integers are whole numbers, floats are decimals. Text data in R is also known as character data, or strings. The idea of yes and no are encoded by the logical data type, also known as Boolean values. Numbers, strings, and logical values are the basic building blocks of all data. R has another data type called a factor. Some people might call it a data structure, but I think it's easier to think of it as a type. On the surface, a factor looks like a string, but underneath, they're represented as ordered numbers. Factors are useful for some statistical models because they can be used to represent categorical data. So that's what data is, but we usually deal with collections of data. This means that you need to know about data structures so that we can store data in them. First is the vector. A vector is just an ordered set of items that have the same type. We can create a vector by placing data inside rounded parentheses preceded by a C. This C stands for combine or concatenate, so this code indicates that we want to combine all the data within the parentheses into a vector. We can access parts of a vector through indices. R is a one-indexed language, which means that the first number in any data structure is indexed by the number one. This is different from zero-based languages like Python. Next is the matrix. A matrix stores data in two dimensions, which are called rows and columns. Matrices can only contain numbers, and they're a major concept in statistics. To create a matrix, we use the matrix function, which lets us specify what data should be stored and what dimension the matrix should be. R also provides a data structure for higher dimensional matrices called arrays. It's unlikely that you'll need to use one as a beginner, but you should know that they exist. Now we come to lists. Lists enable us to store different data types in the same structure, and let us store data in terms of key value pairs. We use the list function to create lists. If we don't specify names for the keys, R will use numbers to index the list elements. Lists are extremely important and we'll come back to them later in the video. Data frames are what you probably think of when you imagine a data set. Data frames have the same shape as a matrix, but each column can represent a different data type. Each row in a data frame represents an observation, while each column represents a characteristic. For the most part, this would be the main data structure that you interact with in R. In the tidyverse paradigm, we work with tibbles instead of data frames. They're essentially the same thing, but tibbles have some extra functionality. The specific details of this extra functionality aren't important, but it's good for you to know that they're similar, but distinct from data frames. One of programming's greatest strengths is that we can perform repetitive tasks quickly, and we can do this through iteration. R provides two ways to perform iteration, for loops and while loops. A while loop will perform the same chunk of code as long as the condition of the loop is true. You need to have a way to change this condition within the brackets or else the loop will run indefinitely. The for loop will perform the same chunk of code for all the elements of a given set of items. Usually, you need to take the results of the calculation in a for loop and store in a new data structure. For loops are useful when you know exactly how many times or elements that you need to repeat yourself. While loops are better when you don't know, such as in an optimization task. Because of this, for loops are more commonly used. The while and for loop are the basic forms of iteration that come in the base form of R, which we'll call base R. There are many other ways to perform iteration in R that make it easier and faster to do, but this is a topic for another video. There will be times when you need to run code in some situations, but not others. For this, we use control flow. Like many other languages, R implements control flow through an if statement. If the condition following an if statement is true, then the code within the brackets will be run. Otherwise, it will be ignored. You can add additional conditions to an if statement by adding an else if branch. The order of these conditions matter. 
Once a condition is met, the conditions further down are not checked, so keep that in mind. Finally, we can specify a chunk of code to run if none of these conditions are true. This can be done by adding an else branch to the if statement. I don't recommend doing this since it's very easy to make unintentional mistakes, especially if there's lots of conditions. You can keep it simple. It's common to need to use the same set of code many times. Rather than rewrite the same code over and over again, you should place it inside of a function instead. A function is just a piece of reusable code. We can give a function inputs that we want to be processed inside of the function. To define a function in R, you need to give your function a name, and then write the function keyword. After this, you specify what inputs this function should take, and then define all of the code you want to run when you use this function. Then, when you want to use all of this code again, you can just use the function within your code instead. As a statistical programming language, Base R provides lots of functions for common statistical procedures. For example, the LM function lets us do linear regression, while the GLM function lets us create generalized linear models. Lots of people program in R, and many of them have developed useful bits of code. Rather than keep it to themselves, people can share code or software by creating packages. Packages are collections of data and functions that others can easily load and use. Packages can be stored and downloaded from the Comprehensive R Archive Network, or CRAN which is our central software repository supported by the R Foundation. People can also download other people's code on GitHub, and that's where you can keep all of your pet projects and other bits of unpolished code. When you download R, the only way to program with it is through a simple console. It's not easy to work in this type of space, so it's better to download an Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, for R. The most commonly used IDE for R is RStudio. RStudio provides an environment that makes it easier to keep track of your programming. There's a console to run R one-liners, and there's an environment viewer for keeping track of what variables you've created. There's also a file viewer for seeing what files or folders you're currently in your workspace, and another pane working longer files and examining variables. I highly recommend downloading both R and RStudio at the same time. It's time to explore the tidyverse paradigm of R, which is a distinct style of coding in R from regular base R. The tidyverse is a set of packages that contain almost all of the functionality you would need for doing statistics and data science quickly and reproducibly. The tidyverse encompasses the entire data science cycle, which includes bringing in the data, cleaning and processing it so that it's usable in an analysis, and extracting knowledge from it through data visualization and actual statistical analyses. We're going to go through this cycle, and I'll highlight how each package in the tidyverse fits into it. The first step in the cycle is to load the data and this is the domain of the reader package. The most important functions in this library come from the read family of functions. For example, if you're working with comma-separated value files or CSV files, the read CSV function is what you'll use the most. There's equivalent functions for different data files, including TSVs and other delimited files. The core tidyverse is a set of nine libraries, but there are many other libraries built with the tidyverse paradigm in mind. I'll call these tidyverse adjacent packages. For example, Excel files are not natively supported by Reader, but there's a package called Read XLSX that serves this exact purpose. The workhorse function from this library is called Read XLSX, which follows a similar format to the Read family in the Reader library. Once these datasets are loaded in, they're stored in the form of tibbles. The tibble library is dedicated to the creation and management of tibbles. While it's not directly used as much as the other libraries, we can create our own tibble by using the tibble function. Before we get into working with data, we need to talk about one of the Tidyverse's most important tools. The Tidyverse is powerful because it lets you develop clear, self-contained pipelines that can encompass the entire data science workflow. The Tidyverse accomplishes this through the pipe operator, which allows us to easily string functions together. Almost all the functions in the Tidyverse take in a tibble as an input and outputs a modified version of that tibble. In the first part of the pipeline, we may load in a dataset. Then, we can pipe this raw dataset into another function that lets us tidy and transform it. The end result is much cleaner to read and understand. There are two versions of the pipe that are used in the tidyverse. One looks like this, and it's the older of the two, and the other one looks like this. It's rare that raw data is immediately usable after we load it in. We usually have to do this ourselves, a process called data cleaning. The dplyr package supplies many of the functions needed for cleaning data. There are many functions in the dplyr library, but here are the key ones to know. The select function lets us choose columns that we want to keep in an analysis. The filter function lets us choose what rows to keep based on conditions we specify. 
Finally, the mutate function lets us create new columns. We often combine it with functions from the other tidyverse libraries, especially when we want to process specific types of data. The stringer library is specialized in manipulating text data, the lubridate library is designed for working with date and time data, and the forecats library is specifically for factor data. But the tidyverse can handle so much more than simple data within a tibble. To understand how, we first need to understand what a list column is. If we were to inspect the specific column within a tibble, we'll see that it's represented by a vector. But we can also use lists to store information within the column, and we call these list columns. Remember that a list is a data structure that can hold different types of data together. This includes both simple data or even data structures. The fact that we can use list columns as columns in a tibble means that we can store more complex items within its cells. For example, this is especially helpful for simulation studies. We can generate several simulated datasets and place them within a list column. Then using the mutate function, we can create a new list column that analyzes the data in each row with a statistical model. The per library provides a family of functions for working with list columns. These functions all start with the word map, and they allow us to apply a function to all the rows in the data, using the values of other columns as inputs. Since a function can theoretically return any type of output, the output of the map function is a list column. In data analysis, we have a notion of wide and long data. Wide data is data that has more columns than rows, while long data is the opposite. This sounds obvious, but these formats have different advantages. Wide data is easier for humans to read, but long data is easier for computers to use. The tidier library provides functions that allow us to change the shape of our data, and that includes moving between wide and long data. The functions that I use the most are pivot wider and its sister function, pivot longer. Once we've cleaned the data, we can start learning from it, and one of the fastest way to do this is through visualizations. This brings us to the last package that we haven't covered yet, ggplot2. The gg in ggplot stands for the grammar of graphics, and it provides an intuitive system for building beautiful and easy to make plots. The idea behind ggplot2 is that we build plots in layers. First, we describe what data we want to visualize, and then we start a plot with the ggplot function. From there, we can specify what data we'd like to use on one or both of the axes. Then we can choose what kinds of plots we want to use to visualize the data. ggplot calls these geoms. For line plots, we could use geom line. For scatter plots, there's geom point, and there are many more. Thanks to the layering philosophy of ggplot, we don't just have to pick one. We can add as many layers as we want to make sure that our plot tells the exact story we want to tell. ggplot has many themes built into the package, so getting a more refined look is just another layer to add. Finally, R provides lots of tools that we can use for showing our work. We can easily make reports in R using R markdown files because we can mix both code and text together. All of our analyses can be accompanied by helpful explanations for what a reader should be paying attention to. Once you're done writing, you can convert your report into a more shareable format like a PDF or HTML file. Another powerful tool for sharing work is the Shiny package. Shiny allows people to build interactive apps and dashboards almost entirely from R code. This allows you to package up complex analyses into an interface that others can use without having to run actual code themselves. As a graduate student, I regularly build Shiny apps for various projects to learn and practice new statistical ideas. R is a powerful tool for doing statistics. If you're looking to learn statistics or earn that cushy data scientist salary, then you won't get far without it. This is by no means a comprehensive guide for learning R or the tidyverse. The point of this video is to teach you the key functions that will let you get started using R to interact with data and getting your first reports out. We didn't talk about it in this video, but R has a robust library of functions for the most common statistical procedures. If you want to use those properly, you should consult my explainer series on statistical concepts. If you'd like to stay up to date with the channel and get some extra content, consider subscribing to the Substack. I'll see you in the next one, and happy learning in 2024.